Sarah, talk to us about the dating scene. What, what are the um, opportunities and challenges that you observe? Well, I think within the, the Christian dating scene as a whole, two things, that it's quite hidden and that it's uh, quite confused or confusing. Personally, I feel like we don't talk about it enough, um, given that, what, I mean, depending on what church you're in, 50% plus probably a single, Everybody in that church probably has been single at some point in their life. I, it's not a unique life stage, and yet I think it can feel um, isolating, perhaps, just because these conversations aren't happening, even though everybody's probably feeling quite similar um, and going through diff you know, similar things. So that's why I'm really excited about this conversation and that we can hopefully have lots of conversations off the back of it and start talking about it and normalising it. Um, because I just think the more... The more we talk about it, the more we just acknowledge that there are challenges, there are opportunities. So, you know, it doesn't have to be seen as, oh, poor you, you're single, which I think, um, I don't, personally, I don't feel like I've had that from other people, but I think there's almost this expectation. I, don't, I can't quite put my finger on, you know, I think that's how a lot of people can feel other people think they think. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, Baz, what's it really like being single and a guy in the church? I think when it comes to the more difficult side of it, um, a lot of the time, so I'm an overachiever, and a lot of the time I'm so, I sort of feel like being single in the church is an underachievement. If you haven't found that, that partner um, or stop, you know, are on the process of getting engaged or are engaged or married, then you haven't achieved something, and that's the kind of sense that I get often with the church and with the people around me. And like to, to make your, yeah, literally to make yourself more visible, to make yourself more available and aware to other people, you have to kind of say, oh, I'm here. Um, and that's kind of sometimes a challenge. I guess the, the small achievements or the, or the big achievements in your life are less celebrated than oftentimes will be, or in my opinion, would be like a, um, a married person or an um, engaged person. Um, and I think that yeah, that can sometimes crush you a little bit because you're like, you know, I've, I've done so well, I've achieved this, I've, you know, I've graduated, I've got a new job, I've got these, these different things. And people might be like, oh yeah, well done, pat on the back. Um, without, you know, the big hurrah that people might make about other things, um, like an engagement, for example. Rowan, what would you say the church can do better in terms of how we support single females and males? A lot of what Baz said I'd agree with. I feel the way of phrasing it is like a marriage is like a rite of passage and I feel in the West we don't really have them anymore. There's very few that we have. We have, we have kind of marriage, we have births, engagements. So if you're not passing those thresholds you don't get celebrated like Baz was saying. And I think as, as a church we could be more creative and imaginative in what other rites of passage might be. It's like moving house or whatever if a single person is has just bought a house or is moving into a new house or, or whatever let's buy them a housewarming gift or let's make sure we go to a housewarming party or, you know just really celebrate it so i think part of it is being creative around what are these life events that um, other life events that we could also celebrate do you have a sense of what you think healthy community should look like in the wider church where I guess people who are not single are supporting singles and singles are supporting mm. marrieds and elderly and whoever, with a widow, divorced. Yeah, I, I think healthy community largely should look the same in my mind for married people and single people. Um, again, referencing something Baz said earlier, I think some of the challenges single people can face to the community they might want is not on them or that they don't have the control over it because it can be married people not engaging or not for whatever reason not being willing to engage not giving that time that they would want so <clears throat> there is a bit of an onus on on that side i think to be aware of that but ultimately i think we're called to covenantal relationships as a church and we're called to um interdependent self-sacrificial relationships uh not just within marriage but between you know across the church and I feel as single people and as married people, we're not very good at that. We're, our society doesn't encourage that, not just in the church, like generally our society doesn't encourage that. It encourages individualism, so to speak. And I think we can see 
we're often looking for kind of self-actualization um, rather than maybe community actualization, maybe, you know, a phrase I might make up. So instead of when we're single and when we're married, being committed to a bigger body of people, say our church, and wanting that to flourish and our measure of success being how we're committing to that flourishing. Mm -hmm. As individuals, we can be just looking to the self and we're willing to just move towns, move cities, move jobs, you know, drop our community basically, trying to search for this self-actualization. And even when we're married, you kind of find that that didn't sort it either. And it's only when I think you realize that community is such a central part of what it means to be human and to be satisfied as a human, even if that's difficult, even if committing to others in that way, in a marriage or outside of it, is difficult. It actually is what we're looking for in terms of that fulfillment. Um, so I think it looks the same for both. And I think we're bad, both as singles and married people in the West. And I think, again, the church has a great opportunity to be creative and imaginative um, in how we get better. I think to what Rowan just said about this co these covenantal relationships, like if we can foster a culture of vulnerability in our church as a whole, you know, not just in relationships, but if we're thinking about having those relationships in our, you know, um, being vulnerable with our connect groups, with our friends, like having that depth and honesty with each other, I think that's almost the starting point because then once you're in a position where I think, you know, the deepest relationships have to have some form of vulnerability to you know otherwise they're going to stay on the surface and that's true whether that whether it's a dating relationship or a friendship or anything else so i think if we can get to a point where we're more frequently vulnerable and taking risks in our relationships with one another then then that will probably almost open up opportunities to do that in in dating relationships as well and kind of normalize it uh, and i think also just taking the pressure off it so you know we've I had a lot of mixed messages, I think, from the church generally over the years, like from, um, I don't know if anyone else read I Kissed Dating Goodbye by Josh Harris in the 90s, <laughs> which he, he has now retracted and apologised for publicly. Um, but that concept of courtship, and I think more generally, this message is still communicated that you should only date someone intentionally that you think is going to lead to marriage, which there is, I can see that there's some benefit in that, but there's a, but it can go too far the other way. And I think if you go on a first date with someone and it's like an interview, am I going to marry you? <laughs> like that's so much pressure on you. That's so much pressure on the other person. And I, I think even that expectation of that pressure is kind of killing any natural, like casual, let's go for a drink and see if we, if we click. Like if you think of your good friends, like you didn't, the first time you met them and decided to hang out or do something together, like you didn't think, right, let's go for a coffee and see if you're going to be my best friend for the next 10 years. Like, you know, it, those relationships grow naturally. And I think if we can make that happen in dating as well and just remove that, that pressure valve of, I, I think then hopefully people will feel more comfortable asking people out. Like, and also this, this fear of reject, like, you know, obviously it is very vulnerable to ask someone out and you've got this fear of rejection. And, and I think that's, common to whatever human experience you're in, whether that's um, dating or applying for anything that you put yourself out of your, out of your comfort zone, there's a risk that someone will reject you. Um, but if we can, you know, we are a church family, that if we can love and support one another, it's never going to be easy. But I think if you have that expect common expectation within a community, within the wider dating scene, that's you know, this, this person is human. They've done an incredibly brave thing asking you. Like, there are, you don't have to feel obliged to say yes. You don't have to feel guilty for saying no. You know, I think there should be, if we can set a sort of a ground level of, let's just be, find it easier to ask one another and, and just acknowledge that they've done a really risky thing um, and let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know? Baz, back to you, what, as a single person, I know you can only speak for yourself and not for other people, but what would you ideally want from married couples or, you know, married friends or people in the church in terms of community? It's just relationship, isn't it? It's time, um, energy and like, you know, being invited around for dinner, um, being able to, if you've got kids, like being able to babysit your kids and like, things like that, that's kind of a, an amazing way that... I would love to, you know, interact with. Um, You're very welcome to babysit people. my kids. <laughs> <laughs> you live a bit far away. 
um, but yeah, so like it's just that kind of feeling of um, the fact that you're embraced and you're welcomed and things like that. Just how, you know, for me, I would be, a, I would welcome them into my house and stuff like that. And I guess like encouragement um, with certain challenges because being in the dating scene can be difficult. And, you know, personally, I would like to get married at some point and I don't necessarily know some of the challenges that they have in their marriage or some of the things that they might struggle with um, because there's almost like a, there can be like a rosy picture that's painted of what it is to get into a rela like a long-term relationship and a marriage and whatever. And it would be nice to, you know, be aware of the realities so that it's not this ideal thing that I'm like, oh, I'm missing out so much because of how it's portrayed to, you know, weigh up how I want to go into that. That, I was going to say, Baz, that reminded me of something I was thinking about that in terms of community, and this is kind of maybe an odd one, but like holidays, like a couple of years ago, I was speaking with some friends and they said, oh yeah, we like, they basically have decided they're going on holidays with other couples who have kids. Now, I did go on a holiday once with one of my good friends and her kids voluntarily. I signed up for that because I love my friend. I want to spend time with her. There were points when it was a bit exhausting, so I get that. But, you know, I thought, but I like, I like being with you. I want to go on a holiday with you. And now, like, apparently I can't because I don't have kids to, like, swap out or something. Or, you know, my, maybe I want, just want to lay at the beach while you play over there with your children. Um, and I think just, I don't know, thinking through things like that or even people who don't have kids who might just want to go on holidays with couples. And I think when you're single, it's like, I can kind of have flexibility to go when I want, but then I have to try to coordinate that with every other single person I know. <laughs> and it's a bit tricky and complicated. And so I think even in that way, just inviting single people into community, don't assume we don't want to go on your holiday with you and your children. Maybe that you feel like that sounds a nightmare to us, but we might actually just really enjoy being with you and your family and it'd be great actually to go with you. And usually they're more planned than I am, so there's there's that. I want, I want someone else planning a holiday that I can go on, but... My, my impression is that, because for those reasons, historically, it's been difficult to ask someone out, especially in a closer community, my impression has been that if it... Does it feel easier to do online dating and dating apps, would you say? I would say easier, but not necessarily... That, I think there are good and bad things about dating apps. So I think it's beyond the, ch the Christian culture, like dating culture as a whole, I think these apps have come up in what, the last, I don't even know, eight to 10 years, five to 10 years. Um, and I think it's generally speaking, become a bit of a crutch because it's a far easier, way lower risk thing to just message someone online. Um, and if it doesn't work out, then that's fine. You, close the app and they're gone, you never have to see them again. And it's almost like in a church setting, it's even more pressurised because not only do you have to see them again, but you also have to see them every Sunday. You probably have lots of mutual friends. Like there's suddenly <laughs> the stakes are very, very high. So I guess apps are low stake, which is good. And it also broadens like the dating pool, so to speak, because if, particularly if you're wanting to date someone who shares your faith, I think um, you know, apps are good for that in that you can bring people, you can meet more people than you would in your day-to-day -day life um, but I think the danger of it is that you you know these are set up in the same way that social media apps are set up in that they'll they'll ping you when you match with someone they'll give you a dopamine hit like it's far easier to think oh it's fine it didn't work out I'll just keep swiping and I think if dating apps are the only way that you uh, meet people that it's may broaden your options in terms of numbers, but doesn't broaden the depth of those opportunities, if that makes sense. So um, one of the problems with dating apps is that it's a stranger. You don't know anything about them. You, know, they don't, you don't know their friends, their family. You don't see them in social situations. It's literally just a face on a screen. And even at the most basic level, the, the, um, like the incent not incentive, but the excitement of talking to them, inevitably, if you start talking to them, it's this small talk with a stranger and you know I'm bad at replying to messages at the best of times with friends on whatsapp and this is someone who I don't even know I I'm just some people are better at replying to messages than I am but you know and it's very different to meeting someone in person where you can tell instantly if you click with them you can tell if you've got some stuff in common like it's, it's so it can be quite hard work to go from matching with someone on an app to actually going on a date 
And even if you do go on a date, it can be very clear within 30 seconds that it's not going to work out. So then you've invested two weeks of small talk on this app and then getting ready for this date. And then, you know, so it can be a bit soul destroying after a while if you do that cycle a few times. So I would say, you know, if people haven't used apps before, I'd, I'd recommend them personally. I feel like it's a good way to meet more people, but also use it as a way of building your confidence of talking to people and recognise that there are lots of other ways you can meet people as well, whether and maybe not on a Sunday morning if that, or evening or, or in your actual church service, if that's, you know, you probably know most of the people there and that can be quite challenging, but, you know, there are lots of Christian weddings, that's one thing we do well, there's lots of weddings, <laughs> um, there's Christian, you know, parties, there's friends of friends, like, and I think if you can be open to meeting someone more organically as well, alongside the app, then that can be it can be a useful tool just to kind of open your mind to the idea of dating. Mm. Just to add to the point that you made um, with the apps, I think they can be quite addictive. Um, and I think that can sometimes be a replacement like of the gratification you might get from a relationship from a friend or from your family or whatever. And it, you can replace it with being on the app and being like, oh, someone's, someone's like me now, or someone's giving me like, lots of attention and they're very good looking or they're whatever. Um, and I think also it cr can create in you this sense of like the grass is always greener, there's always something better out there because um, I guess if only a few years ago you would have been limited to your people that you meet face to face. You didn't have this whole option of like basically the entire of London available to you if you live in London and yeah it just creates in you that like checklist like yeah they've got this and this and this and <clears throat> the gra and then you meet someone and you get on really well but you're like yeah i don't know about that particular thing about them and then you're like oh grass is always greener back on the app do something else and i think that's that's something we really need to break down and consider in our minds like how does that affect us what does that do to us what does that do to our spiritual lives what does that do to how we objectify or see people and it just needs yeah a little switch in our brain yeah. to check ourselves when we're doing that. Something to add on, you started moving on to, maybe we could think of other ways also, could keep thinking of other ways to meet people. So use apps, but keep thinking about the other ways. I know I could be much better at actively thinking, I've got this single friend, I've got that single friend, I think they might get on. You know, I could at least message them both and be like, would you be up for it? And I don't do that enough. And I, you know, that's again, that's for single people and married people, we could all do that. And I think we obviously don't have as much arranged marriages you know, in most of the cultures, particularly people in our church, we come, I'm sure some people do in their culture, but not everyone. But there is a benefit, benefits, you know, even if it's friends helping arrange things or friends helping bring things together, you, you know the background of both people, you have that insight, it's not as impersonable as maybe an app can be, and it gets rid of some of those difficulties, I guess, so, yeah. I know not everybody probably likes to be set up, so no. I think it's always good to ask, but I do think what is helpful, what you said, I appreciate. I think about people, you know, I know this person, they're really great, and this person. I think sometimes what I find frustrating is that people, they're like, oh, Nicole's single, and they'll just think of any person they know, you know? Mm. Like, I know this guy, yeah. here you go. And I'm just like, hey, I got standards, man. <laughs> they're like, just pull some brother off the street. Like, I just, you know? Do you like him? Do we have anything in common? Like, I'm, yeah, anyway. So I think even that's important. Like, don't just think, I know a single person and a single person match. Like, be thoughtful in thinking through who you're going to introduce people to. Just because I'm single doesn't mean that any guy who walks through the door of church on Sunday morning is a potential life partner for me mm -hmm. if they're single. <laughs> yeah. Or me for them. And this is just my personal opinion, so I'm 47 and single. I think part of it is that as you get older, kind of the pool of available people becomes quite small. And, you know, in the church, I think you generally find often that the older you get, the more single women you have, the fewer single men you have kind of in the same age range. And so, yeah, there, there's already kind of a limited pool. And so, like, it's kind of normal in the culture, I think even in the church culture, that older men dating single women, maybe it feels a little creepy to some people, but it's more normalized. If a woman did that, you know, it, it feels like it, it's not the same thing. And so I think part of the problem when you're, when you, as you get older as a woman, there are less men your age who are available. Yeah. So the men you generally tend to meet are younger than you are. And so that can also be its own, its yeah. own barrier. And so, yeah, yeah I think there are yeah. some the social ramifications. Yeah. 
We, we live in a culture that is sex obsessed and in church we can um, idolise marriage, I guess. How would you say you have dealt with that as a single yeah. lady? I think it's hard. Um, you know, I think in the church, at least in the cultures I've lived in, um, have tended to be very pro-marriage. And I think marriage is very good. I think marriage is great. But I think we've been pro-marriage to the exclusion of, of kind of honoring singleness or kind of what you were saying earlier about. It. It's like we value one more than the other. In a way, it feels like we're forming people toward marriage. Marriage is the end goal. And, you know, I think when I, when I look at the Bible, I think the theology says that Jesus is the end goal. And marriage or singleness or kids or job can be part of the narrative, but they're not the end. He's the end, and those things might come and go. And so I think it puts a lot of pressure then on the search for a partner, like the search for that kind of intimacy, because you can't have it if you're married. And so, you know, just I think it really, I think it leaves this question in the church and in the culture. If you are single, can you actually be satisfied in life? Do you have desires that are so great that you will never have them fulfilled in any other way than this one thing? And, and I think without actually saying that, that's what you think. And so there, you know, there can be great, I think, dissatisfaction that you, that you struggle with. But I think as you start to realize there's actually lots of ways that we can experience intimacy and relationship. Like um, a friend of mine was saying the other day, this book she was reading was talking about this and the author was saying, you know, sex is really about kind of, uh, how did you say it? Sex is about like kind of turning ourselves to the other in that sense. But, but you can do that in different ways. You can do that in serving people. You can do that in hospitality. There are lots of ways you can turn to the other without it only being sexual intimacy. And so, yeah, I think in, especially in my early 20s and 30s, it was really hard because that's kind of the, the narrative I heard all the time. And I felt like I'm, you know, clearly I'm single. I've missed the boat. Singleness is bad. Marriage is good, which I don't think people really believe I think without thinking they say it but I don't think people really believe that but I think um it, it has been kind of the narrative and yeah I think it just it puts pressure then on on marriage as the only answer the only solution to be happy I can be truly happy when um when the reality is we can actually still be happy healthy people single or married people who are married aren't necessarily happier people than people who are single so you know it not only skews singleness it also then skews marriage in a way that it never was meant to be, I think. I think it's such an interesting point. And for me, like, there's lots of creativity that you can use in your own life to enhance those kind of things. And I think based on your desires, um, you can like be creative in how you do your life. And for me, like one, one example of this is, um, I was speaking to a few friends, um, maybe last year, and I said, if, if I get to a certain age, I really want children. And if I get to a certain age and I don't have children, then I would consider adoption and going on my own. And the reaction was like, what? Never, like, you can't do that, blah, blah. What, what about all this challenge? And this? I'm like, I would be fully aware of the challenge and I would like, but if that's my desire, if I want to have children and I don't have a partner, how will I do that? I, you know, that's, I would be more than willing and want to go through that process. So, like, people don't necessarily speak about those kind of things. People don't open up about, you know, those challenges. Like, if you are single and you do want kids, what do you do? And, you know, those options need to be spoken about, need to be, people need to be made aware of them. Um, and they're out there, like, it's not something that you can't achieve. So, yeah. And I also think the church is quite a unique opportunity for thinking particularly about adoption and fostering. Like, if you're doing that as a single person, you have this community around you. You have so many mother, father figures, you've got good friends, you've got other friends that they can be, you know, church community is uniquely positioned to support adoption and fostering in general, but also support single people in that. So, yeah. Baz, there's, there's obviously people around who know that they want to get married, but the idea of commitment scares them. And one of the reasons could be that they come from a broken home themselves or they've experienced trauma 
or there's something in their past or present that is um, causing them to doubt if they can do it. Divorce is at an all-time high. It affects so many people in different ways. What are your observations on this and what's the magic solution? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really, really interesting point. Um, and I've experienced that kind of personally in my own life and lots of my friends have experienced it too. Um, and I think if, you're, if you come from a family background where you've experienced divorce or it's been traumatising or there's been things in your life um, where people who are married or in a relationship have treated each other poorly, that really affects you as you step into relationships. It can make you insecure about the relationship. It can make you less like trusting. Um, and that, that kind of commitment element like may scare you more. Oftentimes I actually find this in um, people of ethnic backgrounds um, because statistically that's you know, something that's more common, particularly in the West, where people might have um, come as refugees, fled their countries, done whatever, and that's put strain on their marriages and then led to um, that effect and the children have felt that. And so I think if you are from that background, you need support and... I guess the willingness of people in good marriages and in good relationships to come alongside you and speak to you about it and be honest and raw about it, be like, these are the challenges, but this is what we can do. Um, and this is how we've worked through all these issues. Um, and I think that's something um, that's kind of missing because there's, um, as, I said, as I said before, there's like a rosy image painted about marriage. And if someone sits there and tells you these are, are genuine difficulties, and you've experienced that in the past, um, but they've gone through it and they've got to the other end and they, you know, this is how they're working through it every day. I think that's a really important thing for, for people to do. But also it's something to be aware of. I guess a lot of times in church we find it a bit awkward to talk about, like, what's your family background? Like, um, you know, my mum and dad divorced or whatever. It's like a taboo subject that people don't tend to talk about. Um, and if you feel more free to talk about it, I guess it gives you that freedom, it gives you that ability to, to share that with, with someone else and get that out of your system um, and be like, look, I'm dating this, this person and I'm struggling because I know this is how me and my like, parents interacted, for example. Um, so yeah, just that awareness from everyone to know about each other's lives like, more deeper and more intimately. Um, um, one thing that I thought of while you're speaking Baz and I know I mentioned this to you earlier like you mentioned like ethnic background and I think if anything the last two years we've we've learned is that those conversations need to happen in the church and I think particularly also in in dating I I can't find a statistic for the UK but um in 2014 OkCupid one of those dating apps they did a a, a survey and they found that on the dating apps Asian men and black men were the least likely to be swiped on those apps, and black women were the least likely of all people to be swiped on any of those apps. And so, you know, that's a whole nother dynamic that as a church community, I think we need to think about if we're gonna create a, a healthy culture of singleness. Also, how does ethnic background, how does that fit into that? And it's okay to, to say that, that that's true. And, you know, and I don't know what the statistic is offline, but I. From my personal experience, I'd be willing to bet that what you're experiencing online is also very true offline. You know, I, when I was younger, I, there was this guy I really liked, I thought he was great. My friend asked him, you know, why don't you like Nicole? She's great. And, and he just really honestly said, it's because she's black, because she's mixed. And that was, you know, his reason. And that just happened. So, you know, that's a whole another part of this puzzle to then put together. But I think it's an important thing that we really need to really support each other in and be aware of. Interesting theme about heartbreak. Um, Sarah, bonus question. I hope you don't mind me asking. <laughs> um, how can we get better at supporting singles who are going through heartbreak or who are just disappointed in this? And this could be someone who's um, been married before and maybe not married anymore or someone who's not yet married and wants to be. How can we help them through and work through that disappointment with God and others, maybe? 
I think it comes back to that sense of community and those covenantal relationships. And on a broader scale, disappointment happens in every area of our lives. And it, with relationships, it feels like it cuts deeper and it's more painful. And if we're in those friendships and those groups where we can just be open and honest with each other and whether that's you know I'm struggling I'm single I'm disappointed that this didn't turn out as I hoped it would or on the other side you know people who are married saying we're struggling in our marriage like I think that those honest conversations it's it's deep friendship that heals things and I, and I think the the heartbreak comes from when you have been vulnerable with someone and you've been you know, had that intimacy with them and that, that relationship is broken. So I think any time a relationship is broken, you need other strong relationships to, mm. to kind of hem you in almost. Mm. There's an element of asking, how are you doing? But if you ask, how are you doing? And let them decide whether they're going to say, actually, I'm really struggling with loneliness right now, or, you know, I they had this bad breakup, like rather than saying, no, not that you would say this, but are you feeling lonely? Like, you know, assuming, <laughs> assuming, maybe. assuming yeah. Cause yeah. Some, and I think the, life you know life of, of being single you know probably life of anyone is mm. there's ups and downs so there's going to be moments where everything's great and you know all the opportunities you mentioned Baz like you're just loving life and then there's then the next evening you could be you know downing half a bottle of wine and mm. in front of Netflix feeling incredibly lonely and and so I think being available on the other end of the phone for someone to call up when maybe it's saying to them if you I know people say this if you need to talk to call me, but if we get if we can get to a point in our relationships where people do feel genuinely like, oh, I'm struggling, like, or even if it's a WhatsApp, like I, I often feel when I'm 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 I sort of only talk to people once I feel like I've resolved the problem, and so I'm like, well, I was feeling really bad last week, but now I'm okay. Mm. But if we can get to a point where when you're in that moment, whatever it is that's causing it, to text someone to just even if it's an SOS and be like, can you just pray and help? Like you know, we over the pandemic we set up these little whatsapp groups for people um working you know, doctors and the frontline workers and just acknowledging that you know as being a doctor that you're going through an incredibly challenging period work personally everything and that we need to support those people in prayer and if we can get if there were what's i think i mean you were in the middle of it but from what i understood people would just text an sos like you know i'm going into work now it's really crazy like please just pray and you'd have three responses like great we're praying for you right now and if we can almost get to a point of being able to have that level of just reaching out to someone mm -hmm. rather than having to be this big sit down like so how's it going are you, are you coping yeah. you know um and just have but i'd say in the short answer letting the person you're speaking to yeah, speak lead to. that conversation yeah and i think even sometimes you know just giving people the freedom to be in that place it's loss that they're experiencing and grief and like that's not you just don't turn around the next day and get over it and so mm. I think as a friend withholding judgment, you know, it's been like three weeks now, are you over this? <laughs> you know, like just, just withholding judgment and letting them be in the place that they are until they're ready to move into a new place, not trying to push them out of it, not trying to like keep them there, but just letting them kind of walk through that process with the Lord at the pace that they're gonna walk through it and, and be, you know, and being able to say, it's okay. You know, of course you're, you know, it's two years later and you're, you know, you, you saw him walking down the street and now you're crying. It's normal. You love this person. You cared about them deeply. How could it not affect you even two years later? That's, that's totally fine. There's nothing really wrong or strange um, about that. Just, I think, letting disappointment be disappointment and letting that be loss and being able to, to live with it in that way. At least I had a friend who did that with me and that was really helpful and I'm trying to, yeah, practice that with people I know. Thank you very much, guys. So good to talk to you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.